Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will be focusing on traditional plant project examples today. And uh, we have a wonderful host of uh, information to share with you. Before we get started and before uh, formal introductions, I'd like to go ahead and uh, stop sharing this little saver screen here and share a little couple minute video here. Let me get out of here. Sorry about that. All righty. Yeah, we're really looking for uh, your participation in our national sur survey process, excuse me. And so uh, here's a little video on that topic. Let me get confirmation. Uh, can everybody see that? Let's see. I need to share the screen again. Sorry. Okay. Here we go. Hey everybody, Kier Johnson Ray is here with Intertribal Agriculture Council. I'd like to talk, talk about participating in IEC surveys. Help us shape Indian Ag's COVID-19 responses. Go to indianag.org slash resilient. You'll find four surveys covering tribal producers, tribal and community leaders, American Indian foods participants, community grocers, food hubs, and cooperatives. The preliminary results are indicating tremendous impacts across Indian countries' ag sectors as a result of COVID-19. We're noticing issues in workforce reduction, sales, supply chain, and loss of cash reserves. The important information you provide to us helps us inform local and national programming and curriculum development for remote learning opportunities. USDA and partner organizations, agencies, and philanthropy have indicated a strong interest in reviewing IC's results to inform their programming as well. Your participation truly is shaping the future of Indian agriculture during the COVID-19 era and beyond. Preliminary results indicate decisive need for assistance to support overall community food systems, access to financing, networking, and professional development. We're learning about the extent of supply chain impacts and the inherent opportunities for our tribal producers in the marketing of their products directly. There is strong interest to buy from Indian country producers. Help us educate Congress with regard to our community's needs during COVID-19 and beyond. ISC is seeking your support to provide the data we rely upon as Indian country's voice in food, agriculture, and natural resource management. Go to indianag.org slash resilient to bring light to your community's needs. Scroll down to the Share Your Stories section. If you're involved in our virtual intertribal food summit, we're asking that you take our five minute survey as part of your participation in the summit. Thank you. All righty. Well, let me uh, pull up my notes here just a second. <clears throat> okay. Thank you all for patience. So today we have, uh, you know, some really great uh, information to share with you. And initially I wanna uh, just provide a little bit of context. We have a, a video, so there's a little bit more uh, uh, backend stuff I'm working on, sorry for, uh, going back and forth between screens here. Uh, we have a, a wonderful presentation by Connor McGee, who is a Paula tribal member uh, from down in Southern California. And he's currently in uh, Costa Rica where he's been there throughout the duration of the, uh, uh, the pandemic because uh, his family was down there. And so they went early on and they've not been able to leave. So um, I think a lot of us might, might uh, see that as not a bad thing um, in some regards. But um, 
he's shared a video with us and um, you know, there's just the logistics of pulling that together. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work with uh, several tribal foods and uh, traditional foods projects down there uh, for years. He works currently with the Climate Science Alliance and uh, helps with the uh, intertribal um, efforts down there. And then we'll also have uh, Chris Borden, uh, who is uh, the, I'm sorry, let me pull up, uh, serves as the Wisconsin NRCS State uh, Tribal Liaison and is uh, the Tribal Liaison for NRCS uh, for the Ho-Chunk Nation. Uh, he's very, very much appreciates the opportunity to work with the Wisconsin Tribal Conservation Advisory Council and the 11 federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin. So he's got a really nice um, presentation lined out that'll highlight the resources available through the NRCS Plant Materials Center, as well as, uh, you know, there's a whole network of them across the country, and then some uh, traditional plant project examples. So that is uh, kind of the scope of today, and we're gonna go ahead and um, move forward. Let me go ahead and get this video set up here. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Niuya, my name is Connor McGee. I'm a Paula tribal member, Kuiya Luceno. I'm a, also a data and research Research Applications Manager at the Climate Science Alliance, and I'm here to present to you today tribal-led conservation and plant management project at the Palma Tribal Farms, which is a tribal farm that is owned and operated by the Palma Band of Mission Indians. So um, we're going to hover over this slide for a while. So the inception of the project is that the tribe had acquired biodynamic and organic farm that had been in that production certified by the state for about three decades. The tribe purchased the farm and this farm had been a polyculture farm that had been worked heavily um, by disc tractoring over the decades and a lot of outputs from the farm but not so many inputs. So once the tribe purchased the farm the conversations really circled around like how to bring the land back, how to how to bring the soil back, how to bring the diversity back to the farm and how we could use the farm as also an education tool for the youth. And so as, as these ideas were swirling around and the kind of how to um, put everything into motion was, was where the project started. There was a few, a few things that we'll be covering over this presentation that brought it all into fruition. The first thing that we needed to do was convene a tribal working group to come up with a plant list to discuss all, all the plants that we'd like to see at the farm, all of our traditional foods, our food fiber and medicine, and then discuss how we can integrate that into the tribe's agricultural commercial production site. And at the first stage of the project, there was a decision made to convert 60 acres of this 86 acre farm into organic olive production. All of the trees were purchased and ordered. Um, all we had to do was plant them. And then through the partnership of a local organization, Solidarity Farm, decision was made to have a 16 acres put into veggie road production. And that portion of the farm there's about 60 different species of veggie row crops that are in production throughout the year, along with chickens and hogs um, that, are, that are worked throughout the land of that 16 acres to rejuvenate the soil and also, of course, for egg production. Right now, we'll focus on the 60 acres where the organic olive orchard is going to be installed. So as we were discussing of all the different methods that we could use to have a re regenerative olive orchard. We talked about using cover crops, hedgerows, and windbreaks. And for the cover cropping, what we did is we decided that we were going to use non-irrigated 
native plant species. One of the primary reasons for doing that is to bring back our annual and perennial grassland species that we use for foods and medicines. And so in doing that, the tribal working group that came up with the plant list, um, this is the focus for our, of our grassland species. These are both cool, cool season and warm season species. Um, with legumes, grasses, clovers, uh, a pretty healthy mix of, of grassland, grassland species that will thrive well in the California environment. And so getting the field ready from um, all of the invasive wheat pressures that have been on the site for a number of years, the degradation in the soil, um, and avoiding all chemical methods of application. That is one thing that the tribe is very explicit on is um, eliminating the use of chemical fertilizers, insecticides, and herbicides. So we have to keep that in mind throughout our entire process of developing plans and strategies for bringing back our grassland species. So the Really, the, the most effective, efficient tool that we have in our toolbox is our prescribed bird methods. We needed to eliminate the invasive seed species that were continually to come up from having the site work so heavily disturbed over the years. Um, we needed to remove the debris from the site to be able to plant the orchard and seed drill our, our grassland species. And also, um, we saw the added benefit for having char rate in the field, which helps with a lot of the germination of our native grassland species in California. So in collaboration with the Palma Tribal Farm, with the Palma Band and Mission Indians Fire Crew, Cal Fire, and a lot of tribal volunteers, we were able to work fire across the 60 acres of the farm. There was discontinuity in fuel so what we did we just kept moving fire across the field until the field was burning this is really successful as far as um, getting the field cleans removing a lot of the invasive wheat pressure and terminating a lot of those seeds that we didn't want to see on the farm as we we're trying to bring back our native grassland species our uh, no seed drill uh, no-till seed drill you see behind you, we contracted with, a, with the farmer in Modesto, California, about 10, 10 hours away, who had this specialized equipment. We were going to stop tilling the soil so that we can bring back all of the healthy microbial, fungal um, populations to the soil so that we could continue to build and increase the soil organic carbon and increase our water holding capacity and have, um, have healthy root growth and, and room for our perennial grassland species to come back as well. So this implement, which is hard to come by, but through being put in contact with various people, we were able to uh, meet, with, meet with this gentleman that was able to come out and help us meet our objectives. This is, uh, this is my son, Kwaha. Best way to, to teach anyone or to show them showing the intentions behind everything that's being done is to come out to the farm and, and witness it, right? So uh, he, he had a lot of fun this day and this happened to be the best picture as well for the no-till uh, no seed drill. And here we could see um, Leslie Miller is his name in action with his no-till seed drill after, um, after a lot of the olives had already been planted. We did four rounds of um, seed drilling at an uh, over a two year period. I believe this was in the fourth year that this image was taken. And this is what we get. This is um, our grassland species coming in after, after a good season of rain, which is hard to predict. But these, these plants have, have adapted for this. They've evolved for this. The, the, the California climate, prolonged drought, semi-arid conditions, coarse textured soils. Um, it's really hard to believe how, how all of these species can thrive with a lot of these challenges um, with low precipitation and temperature, but um, they do and it's proven um, in, our, in our demonstration here in the tests that we're doing 
at the farm. And we were really, really happy to see this. It really, it's hard to um, talk about this without seeing all the work that went into seeing this grassland come back. And here are a lot of our species um, that came off that we're really happy to see. In the top left corner is uh, Calendrinium zizii, a red maid, which is um, its seeds are high in fat. It's been a long, long traditional food for, for us in Southern California. And then just below it is our native chia, which is again, one of the staples um, for our, our, our seed foods. And then, of course, the poppy and the lupins that you can't miss. And so while we're doing this, we have to keep in mind that we're, as we're conducting these tests and doing these demonstrations that we have to produce good data. Um, and surveying is a key, key component in that. So Starla Madrigal here, a Palma tribal member and trained botanist here, is working in the fields with us to take good sampling randomized sampling to see, check our seed emergence, and if our, our weed pressure abatement is working by introducing these native plant species um, in, on the site. And if you recall the, the images before of all those tumbleweeds and invasive brooms, we're gradually working them out by reintegrating the native, native grassland species. But the, it's most important to be able to do the on the farm research throughout the process to have, to have the good data to stand on and make informed decisions in the future. So transitioning to our hedgerow and windbreak um, practice, again, the tribal working group compiled a plant list, which was far larger than what we see here on this slide, but our primary filter is both for the grassland seeds and the, our trees and shrubs is availability. Um, we dreamed up quite a lot for our plant species, but being able to find them, to source them, um, was the major challenge. So that was our primary filter. And then of course, just um, location suitability and our, our, our annual temperatures at the farm, our precipitation, all those things we have to take into account to see if we're going to have successful um, planting here. So there's, a, there's roughly about 40 species here that you see that we're, we're putting into the trees, trees and shrubs list for the hedgerow and wind, wind breaks. And um, we had some pretty, pretty bad um, water conservation concerns on the farm as the system that was inherited um, was reaching its it's, it's in time, we had little oases and uh, riparian areas that were popping up and those were from leaks in our system. So the first thing that we had to do was um, put in a, a, some new water lines at some parts of the farm. We had to, from there we had to stem off those main and sub mains and reach them out to our windbreak and hedgerows. And this, so this was a planting day that we had for, um, a windbreak at the farm, and this is our, our native California native walnut and um, mesa oak or Engelman oak, which is a, a species that is rare and thrives in our area and also has does, does really well in dry conditions, more so than a lot of the other Southern California oak species. And we also have our Ace Nagundo, one of our, our riparian plants that we use a lot. And so from that plant list, we started getting our plant deliveries to implement our, our hedgerows and windbreaks. And there's our tribal, our tribal crew um, unloading our plant delivery. Here we see, I think we see Mimulus here and a lot of our different um, sages and some of our larger species in the background. Hundreds and hundreds of plants were delivered over the period of a few weeks while we're planting during our planting window in the late winter and early spring. And we can continue. This was another one of our deliveries on the polyculture side. You can see the squashes growing in the background and we're about to plant holly cherry, um, some artemisias, buckwheat, sages, various sages, um, cerises, basketry material. 
and other, other berry plants and medicinal plants. And what does it look like to plant thousands of feet of, of trees and shrubs? This is about, we're looking at about 600 feet of planting here that we have set up to go on the ground the next day. There's our tribal work crew on the, on the mule there. And this is what the, the plantings look like. This is about 100 feet of one of our plantings on the polyculture side. You can see some of the, the chicken coop there working a, a corn stand in the background. And as you recall, if we um, go back to our, our grant, our grassland um, planting, you have to be asking yourself, how is all of this possible? The cost involved, the sourcing of seeds, the technical assistance. Um, how, is, how is a tribe able to just do all of this in one big swath? Well, a lot of it just has to do the way I presented the information, but it's really the foundation of all of this is uh, identifying the resources within, within Southern California, whose goals and objectives meet our goals and objectives at the tribe. The California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Program. We were able to apply for this program, which was launched a few years ago by Governor Jerry Brown. Money was set aside to bring back soils in California to help sequester carbon, to help mitigate storm runoff, to increase the water holding capacity on agricultural sites, all of the co-benefits that are listed across the board for having healthy soils was in this program. The tribe applied and was the only tribe in the state at the time to get the award. And so we proposed to the CDFA that we would transition this polyculture farm into a no-till cover cropping system in an olive orchard. And so we were awarded the demonstration project and that would really helped us catapult into putting in our grassland. And here we're lucky enough to get a visit. Apologies for the quality of this image, but the CDFA Science Committee came down to see our project. Um, luckily enough, we were able to get their attention by everything that we were doing. And so they paid us a visit and we gave them a tour of all of our implementation. Also, another program launched by the state that dovetails right into all of the tribe's objectives at the farm, the California Coastal Conservancy's Climate Ready Program. Almost identical, rebuilding soils. Um, rebuilding soils to help mitigate erosion, stormwater runoff, water quality issues, and build more resilient systems and agricultural production sites upstream. NRCS practices. We um, put in an application for and had a conservation plan drawn up, drawn up for our projects and were able to go and contract right in the perfect amount of time where everything fell into sequence with our, our other two partners, the CDFA and the California Coastal Conservancy. We're able to have these practices support all of our efforts and addressing our water conservation concerns and irrigation systems and all of the plantings and um, the irrigation systems that are needed and required for the plantings, all of the site prep, we're able to loop in with our NRCS practices. So this project is about, you know, in its second chapter, I would say, of, of four chapters, we, we still have a lot of work to do, but we've been tremendously successful into transitioning the 60 acres into uh, the 60 acres of the uh, polyculture farm that was heavily um, tractored and, and worked for decades. We began to rejuvenate it, and with the help of the California Coastal Conservancy and the uh, CDFA, and it's all, it's all based on really, we couldn't have done it without either one of those partnerships. And for all of our, our hedgerow, our trees and shrubs that we've planted, the hundreds of trees and shrubs, the thousands of feet of, of trees and shrubs of 40 different species um, was built off of those relationships as well. And our partnership 
and engagement with the EQIP program through NRCS that helped us all of their technical assistance and throughout the process for from field office biologists to engineers that we were able to contact at any point in time with questions. Um, it, it was built off those partnerships that made it all possible. And one of our key partnerships is with the Indian Health Council. Our local Indian Health Council, who is a TPWIC um, grantee as well, Traditional Practices for Wellness in Indian Country, partners with us to do outreach to our tribal communities in the area and both at Palma, Palma Band of Mission Indians. We organize workshops, we organize cooking classes, planting workshops. We have our elders come out and do workshops for our tribal members for processing plant materials for food, fiber and medicine. And the engagement that we've, that we've had with TPWIC goes across all ages. We've had so many, so many tribal members come out and participate um, in planting days and cooking days and just sharing laughs. And it's that partnership that has really tied us together so with, with uh, the Indian Health Council and being able to be partners with them just brings everything really into fruition that all the work that was done with the various state agencies and federal agencies to to get these plants in the ground and rebuild the soil. Um, it's, it's bringing the community together to celebrate it all that has, that has been one of the main strengths for us. And here's one of our planting days. This, I believe this was, um, the, these kids were putting in the Engelman Oaks and we got to talk about why we're doing it, why it's important. Um, and then learning how it's done and being able to celebrate the, the work day at the end of the day with, with our tribal youth. And when you're planting all these plants, um, you know, weed barriers, mulch, irrigation. We're really proud of our, of our mulch mounds here that we, you know, we work tirelessly to spread so that all of our plantings um, were taken care of, that they had enough enough mulch down to survive the 20 degree days frost and the 110 degree day heat and to keep down the weeds um, so that they're able to go through transplanting fine so here's our crew then uh, all the all the shovels in the groundwork on a daily basis transplanting planting olives maintaining all of the irrigation manifolds and lines um, is right here so um, Really happy to share this presentation with you today. I hope you find it enriching and inspiring. And um, there's still a lot of great work to do. The, the farm keeps expanding. We're, we're waiting for our warm season species to come in from our cover crop. And there's, there's a lot of happy times to be had um, having all of this done. Once again, my name is Connor McGee. I'm a research and data applications manager at the Climate Science Alliance. Um, please visit us at our website to see more of our tribal projects and, and everything that we have going on with our climate kids and in our tribal working group and here's my email and I'm, I'm sure there will be some questions and there's a lot more context to this project so at, at any point in time please feel free to reach out to me I'll be happy to talk about this project more and answer any questions you have so thank you so much Oh. All right. All righty. Well, uh, and again, I do encourage anybody uh, on the webinar today to reach out directly uh, to Connor McGee. He's a phenomenal resource and very well networked uh, locally as well as uh, regionally, and uh, a lot of national contact work as well. So. Um, in terms of uh, the remainder of our time, we do have uh, Chris Borden here with NRCS Wisconsin, and we're so appreciative to have him here. Uh, and let's see, you should have the ability to go ahead and share your screen there, Chris, and move forward with your presentation. And at the end of 
Chris's presentation, there will be a little bit of time for Q&A. And I realized that uh, with the changes of, uh, with the change of uh, showing a video like that, I uh, neglected to introduce myself. So I'm Keir Johnson Reyes with Inner Tribal Agriculture Council, serving tribal communities in California and Nevada uh, as a technical assistance specialist. So uh, alrighty, thank you so much, Chris, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, just real quick, I'm working on making sure the right screen comes up here. Sorry about that. I have uh, I have a certain amount of dyslexia when it comes to how this turns out. Um, are you seeing kind of a full screen uh, slide presentation here? Or are you yep. seeing it coming up with the notes? It looks okay. great. Great. I apologize. I am a boomer. So it's a little bit tough for me to figure some of this stuff out. Connor's not on. Connor wasn't live, right? No, he was not live. Yeah, that was a, a video that he provided to us uh, from Costa Rica, where he is quarantined. <laughs> well, I'm very much looking forward to following up with him because it just it really seems like they had remarkable, remarkable progress there. And uh, it sounds like it sounded like NRCS had some had some ways to, to fit in an appropriate way that maybe we're not doing here in Wisconsin. So I'll have to give him a call. Yeah, um, I love that. Yeah, that was, that was remarkable and it's gonna be a tough act to follow. Uh, my name is Chris Borden, I'm from Wisconsin. I work for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, we're the kind of the conservation end of the US Department of Agriculture uh, on private lands and on tribal lands. Uh, our basic business model is that Congress gives us a sum of money each year part of which pays for staff that's, that's technical staff that helps people plan and implement projects from an engineering standpoint, from a biological standpoint. Part of the money they give us is to, um, is to offset the cost of implementing best management practices on the land. Because a lot of the benefits that, that accrue, accrue to the general public when people apply conservation to land in the country. So that's the rationale for for offsetting those offsetting those costs, so that people aren't farmers, tribes aren't um, aren't as stressed with the costs associated with doing the right thing on the land. Um, we're fortunate in Wisconsin. There's there's 11 federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin, um, and we're fortunate in that we have a strong working relationship uh, with each of the tribes, and we've we have a pretty long history of working together. To, to adapt our programs, to adapt our NRCS programs, to work better for tribal governments, and to, uh, to address tribal concerns. Uh, we're, we feel really happy that the tribes have shown us so much patience and goodwill over the years um, uh, because it gets us to where we are supposed to be because we, we're, we're uh, obligated under our trust responsibilities and treaty obligations, but also a lot of our, a lot of our direction Internally, when it comes to policies in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we are called upon to adapt our programs to meet the needs of, of, of tribal tribes, tribal government, tribal individuals, because there's a recognition that uh, as an agency, we kind of formed in the Dust Bowl years and we got very good at assisting more traditional agricultural operations. And we need to, uh, we have, for lots of reasons, we need to, um, to demonstrate flexibility with our programs when we're working with tribal nations because it's a government to government uh, relationship and there's just a lot of things are different than our work with a dairy farmer. Um, I plan to talk about three things today um, that are helping the in ways that the tribes are helping us uh, adapt our programs uh, to, to develop new conservation solutions. The first part I'm a little less familiar with because I'm putting this on for a person who asked me to step in and talk about the Natural Resources Conservation Service has plant material centers, and a lot of those centers interact with tribes. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the second part will cover how tribes and tribal partners have worked with the natural with us with the Natural Resources Conservation Service here in Wisconsin to develop technical recommendations and financial incentives to encourage the restoration of wild rice stands in northern Wisconsin. Uh, the final part uh, will cover uh, joint efforts that we have going on here in Wisconsin on the part of tribes and the USDA and others to protect, protect black ash ecosystems uh, with the goal of the eventual restoration of black ash uh, ecosystems over time. 
and I need to be thinking here. Um, Susan Baker developed this set of slides and asked me to discuss this today. She works really closely with the tribes and she facilitates the work between the tribes and the, and the Big Flats Plant Material Center in, in Big Flats, New York. Uh, she's very devoted. If you're, in, if, if you're in New York State and you don't know Susan, give Susan a call, email Susan. She's, uh, she's a great talent and she, she's very devoted to getting our agency to better meet our tribal trust responsibilities, particularly in that New York State and New England area. Um, uh, Susan helps uh, facilitate the work in the Big Flats Plant Material Center, uh, work with the local tribal partners. Uh, Big Flats covers the northeastern states, um, and it's been around for a very, very long time. Um, the, this is just to orient you a little bit, the, this plant material center is uh, just to the south of the Finger Lakes region in central New York state. Uh, the Big Flats Plant Material Center, what Susan, Suzanne asked me to talk about today, is that the Big Flat Plant Material Center developed the prop, propagation techniques for local uh, sweetgrass ecotypes. Um, uh, here's the picture of the greenhouse where the sweetgrass plants are grown to supply sweetgrass plugs to tribes who wish to propagate this, this particular eco, ecotype on their lands. Uh, the second picture shows the plugs getting ready to be shipped out. Um, and we do, we, we're, we're a federal agency and sometimes we're not, we're not the brightest bulbs on the tree, but we do really understand that, that each tribe has, each tribe is a very individual nation and that there's, there's real differences of opinion in regards to how appropriate it is to bring plant materials from outside tribal regions onto tribal lands. So we do work with some tribes on this and some tribes are, uh, uh, would, be, would be hesitant to, to uh, work with us on this type of project. Um, um, a lot of times the tribes will be interested in the propagation technique itself that was developed at a plant material center. They're just not interested. They're gonna use their local genotype they're going to find local sources, but a lot of times the propagation technique that was developed at the um, at the center is something that could be helpful to the tribes for the propagating their own genetics, which is um, which is important. This is uh, sweetgrass is is uh, is important here, well, in a lot of places in the country, but I know it's very important here in the Great Lakes states uh, for ceremonial gift giving and and. Um, Plant Materials Center also develop, you know, they develop seed sources and varieties and things like that, but they also uh, provide technical support for, for, to develop technical recommendations when it comes to those propagation techniques, when it comes to, you know, new and emerging ecosystem restoration techniques, you know, stream bank stabilization. Uh, they're very involved. A lot of the centers across the country are very involved with the development of, of locally appropriate cover crops to improve soil health. Uh, I, I education, outreach and education is an important part of the mission of the Plant Material Centers as well. This is a picture of a workshop on declining habitats that took place at Big Flats Plant Material Center back in 2018. Looks like they had a beautiful day and uh, boy, look how close people are standing together there. It kind of makes me nostalgic for, for pre-COVID. Uh, there are 25 plant material centers run by NRCS across the country, they're directed to be responsive to local needs. So a lot of times if you, if you, if you, if you visit the Plant Materials Center, you'll very much see a represent, representation of projects that, that are needed by, and a lot of times kind of traditional agricultural organizations or, or uh, the, the local need in the area. Um, um, the one that serves your tribe should be easy to find online. Uh, I'd encourage you to give them a call and start a conversation regarding tribal perspectives on plant materials needs because a lot of the plant material centers don't have, uh, don't have or just beginning to develop uh, meaningful relationships with tribal nations. And that's, that's, that's something that, that's, that's unfortunate and, and a lot of the centers are looking to, to change. Um, many of the centers uh, do promote the development and use of native plants with, uh, with tribes and tribal partners through, kind of, through demonstration and techniques for local propagation. Um, many centers also act as a, as a native plant foundation seed stocks for different types of, of restoration and, and agricultural land retirement. 
Um, now I'm going to move us from New York State and the Plant Materials Center program to kind of the Great Lakes states. Uh, I've talked a lot about Wisconsin here, but this a lot of these needs and a lot of these these opportunities, a lot of these types of projects are taking place in in northern part of Michigan, northern part of Wisconsin, UP, and the northern part of uh, of the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. Um, Wild rice is, it's hard to overestimate the importance of wild rice in Wisconsin. Um, and not just from a, the standpoint of a kind of rare and declining habitat, uh, but wild rice was the foundation, uh, it was a foundation of the diet of the First Nations peoples in Wisconsin. Um, and wild rice, I don't know if you've had, wild rice is, it yields well, it can be stored for long periods of time. It's very nutritious and it tastes great. A lot of plants you find in the wild are edible, but they don't taste great. This tastes great and it stores and yields well. Uh, wild rice is, is also culturally as well as culinarily important to the tribes in the Great Lakes region. Uh, in the Anishinaabe or the Ojibwe oral tradition, the people traveled to the East Coast and were gone for so long that they, had, they forgot their way home. I forgot how to get home. And uh, the oral tradition states that, that the great, great creator told them they were to follow a sacred shell, which would lead them west, back west, ultimately to a place where the food grows on the water, which is wild rice. Um, and oral tradition and archaeology suggest that about 1,500 years ago, uh, they probably found this place on the south shore of Lake Superior. Um, and it's not just the Anishinaabe peoples here in Wisconsin, but the, the people of the Menominee Nation refer to themselves um, using the Algonquin word for meaning uh, people of the wild rice. So it is, it is remarkably an important resource here in Wisconsin. Um, um, unfortunately, when my folks came over, when the Europeans arrived in the 17th century, we began sort of a, a series of worst management practices, uh, which had pretty serious effects on wild rice in Wisconsin. Uh, first, we trapped all the beaver, which changed stream hydrology and lake hydrology. Then we were done, trapped all the beaver out. Then we cut down all the forests and drove the log, pine logs down our rivers with man-made floods. We, the, they cut the pine during the, uh, during the time where they could cut the pine. They would, they build dams, filled the dam up with logs, blow the dam and the flood would race down our riparian zones, tearing everything up and bringing all the logs down to build the homes in Chicago. Um, then in the 30s and 40s, we did, we engaged in, uh, um, we built a lot of dams for hydropower and those inundated a lot of the, a lot of the wild race areas, uh, which really had really significant effects. And finally, uh, in the 1940s, tourism got really big in the northern part of the state. And so a lot of dams were built on almost all the lakes in order to stabilize the water levels, which is really great for the person who has the dock and has their boat out there and they want to stay at the lake level. But wild rice doesn't want a stable lake level. They want to, that being wants a fluctuating water level. Um, so, after about 30, 300 years of diligently implementing worst management practices on it, the uh, wild rice was really significantly diminished on the landscape in the state of Wisconsin. Um, uh, fortunately, tribes retained traditional knowledge of where the wild rice existed. And they also had traditional knowledge regarding how to restore these areas. And, and importantly, they understood how to identify areas that had been too degraded to support restoration. So they knew where not to spend a lot of time and money and effort. Um, in the 1990s, the Chippewa tribes in Wisconsin, as well as the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, which is the intertribal commission, developed to, um, uh, to assist the tribes in, in expressing their uh, treaty rights. Um, the tribes and the commission uh, undertook efforts to document these restoration methodologies to bring wild rice back. And we were very, very appreciative of the fact that they were willing to share this knowledge with us. 
And we did, we worked with uh, the tribes to develop a, a conservation practice standard, an NRCS conservation practice standard, and a standardized methodology for the restoration of wild rice, which has been used um, in other, has been shared with other states in the Great Lakes region and then also some of the other areas or other small areas that where uh, wild rice is, is native. Um, we also developed a, um, a level of financial assistance to offset the costs of the wild rice restoration. Um, the, uh, um, the slide that's up right now is a little bit of an example. I told you of all of the worst management practices that we brought on to Wisconsin for wild rice. I forgot to mention one of them. One of them is the introduction of carp, which uh, was another brilliant move on our part that really hurt wild rice. And I wanted to bring this up as an example because the St. Croix Band of Lakes, uh, St. Croix Band of Chippewa Indians of Wisconsin um, manage, uh, this is uh, Clam Lake. And back in 2001, they had 300 some acres, 300, almost 400 acres of wild rice that was harvested by native, uh, native and, and non-native uh, harvesters. Uh, it was a wonderful resource, but for whatever reason, carp got up into the lake and they really took off like gangbusters. The, the tribe has done a great job it, and the wild rice resource diminished to a very, very low levels. The, they've got brilliant staff and great leadership at the St. Croix Band and they took it very seriously and they're using, using high frequency radio transmitters to inform their netting of carp. And they've gotten their carp, their carp levels down to the point where it, pays to, where it pays to seed wild rice again. So they went from this picture in 2001 to this picture in 2009 and they're working their way back to having the amount that you see in that picture in 2001. It takes a long time one of the reasons that it takes a long time is they, they, the St. Croix tribe could buy a lot of rice and could seed the lake back pretty quickly, but the local genotype is, is crucial for them. So they're taking the harvest they have on the, the remaining wild rice in that lake and then one adjacent lake, and they're only using that seed. So their pace of their restor restoration is dependent on the success of each, each year's harvest very locally there. Um, and um, local genotype is really important uh, for maintaining genetic diversity, but there's also a point of pride. There's differences in, in taste and texture between rice that's found in different areas. So you don't want to just, no one's interested in just making sure, making this mix generically uh, because of what would be lost. Uh, these, are the, these are the steps. It's relatively straightforward. You can see the steps on the slide here. Um, and you can, you can see by the photo, there's not a huge amount of, of technology when it actually comes to the broadcasting itself. But um, you can't, this looks very traditional method, but what you can't see is the GPS device in the boat so that they make sure that they have coverage and they don't have, they're not doubling up. Um, so they're expanding their seed in, in, a, in a wise way. Uh, pretty much the trickiest part of this is figuring out when to, because you harvest in the fall, put it in sacks, and then sink it to the bottom of a lake that has the right conditions in the water. Uh, the trickiest part is to pull that off the bottom of the lake after the ice comes out and before it germinates, because that, that seed has to go on there somewhere between ice out for accessibility and before it germinates, because once it germinates, uh, if it germinates before it hits the bottom of the lake after seeding it like that, uh, you just wasted your time because it, nothing's going to happen with it. Um, we very much appreciate the, the tribes being willing to share this knowledge with us uh, because we know a lot of times in the past from the federal government standpoint, we have exploited that. We've, we've, we haven't treated the knowledge that's been shared with us with the proper amount of respect. And that might be an understatement sometimes. Um, but we do have, we do have a, a guide to help us act appropriately here in Wisconsin. The 11 federally recognized tribes uh, got together almost 20 years ago now and they formed a Tribal Conservation Advisory Council. And they do advise us on, they do keep us on a, on a good path 
and they're super, super polite to us. And if we listen closely enough, they'll keep us out of trouble and, and get us to understand uh, how things work so we can provide appropriate assistance. Um, the 11 Frederick Knight, the, it's really nice. We have a Tribe Conservation Advisory Council. Uh, they worked, they, they were crucial towards us getting a standard and cost share available for wild rice restoration. Um, and we put a set, set aside amount of money for tribal projects, tribal government projects each year. Um, and the Wisconsin Tribal Conservation Advisory Council, they engage in a, in a collaborative process to determine which projects receive priority for funding. And uh, wild rice seedings always receive just very high priority. Um, it's, uh, it's a remarkable plant from an ecological standpoint, but also from a cultural standpoint. Um, and if you've ever had the shiny black wild rice, you should try the kind that's kind of green and gray and looks a little bit on the fuzzy side because that's the, that's not the cultivated wild rice. That's the wild rice that's harvested true native wild rice. And there, there is a difference uh, in, uh, in the quality there. So uh, the next thing I just want to cover is um, this is an important dynamic. There's probably too much going on in this slide, but but this forest you, you see here is really important to the tribes of the state of Wisconsin. This is a black ash swamp, and um, uh, black ash is really important in Wisconsin and a lot of the a lot of places where black ash is a native tree species. Um, the inner bark of the black ash tree has properties which which allows skilled craftspeople to make amazing looking baskets using techniques that they've honed over thousands of years. Um, and it's, uh, there's an art to it and there's a science to it and there's a utilitarian aspect to it that's, uh, that's pretty remarkable and very, very important. Uh, the, fir the first problem that we have in, we have, we have a half a million acres of forest that look like this in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the first problem is that uh, all of the black ash trees are going to die. Well, 99.99% of the ash tree, black ash trees are going to die in Wisconsin because of this small green being that we see down here, the emerald ash borer. Um, the second problem we have is that ash trees really like to grow alongside, alongside of other black ash trees. So not just a few of the trees in this picture are going to die, but all of the, all of the trees in this picture are going to die. Um, which leads us to the third problem, which is um, all these trees right now, are, they're on a wet site. They act like a pump. The transpiration off of these trees acts like a pump to maintain these soils in a dry enough condition to, to support trees. Um, when all these trees die, and we expect they will die when emerald ash borer comes through, um, these, a lot, these areas, without action on anyone's part, these areas, a lot of these areas will, uh, the, the water table will rise in them and the sites will become too wet to regenerate trees and they will go to a shrub herbaceous cover, which essentially is kind of permanently losing these areas, uh, permanently losing our chance to have these areas in a forested condition. Um, the, the good news is that the tribes and the tribes of the Great Lakes states and universities and the researchers at the U.S. Forest Service and a lot of other partners have studied, have studied, pardon me. I'm really sorry, I should have done that prior. Um, the universities, tribes, U.S. Forest Service are studying how to successfully plant non-ash species in the understory prior to the emerald ash borer infestation. And the thought is get some trees in here that are not ash and get them growing tall enough so that we still have that hydrologic pump, that transpiration taking place here so that we can retain these areas in a forested condition. Um, this will keep stream ecosystems shaded as because there's a lot of stream systems that flow through these, these black ash swamps. So it'll keep stream ecosystems shaded as they face the stress of climate change. And this will also allow for the reintroduction of black ash once those very few resistant trees have survived and their offspring are propagated. If you follow the, 
the research on the ash, it does appear that there's going to be some ash species, some individual ash trees that have a higher amount of resistance to the armored ash borer. The problem is, it's not, that doesn't help us in the short term and all these areas will convert. But the hope is that the reintroduction of those few trees in a forested condition will allow for the recreation of this ecosystem, uh, which will allow for the continuation of this beautiful, functional, traditional skill. So that's the hope. Um, it's, uh, um, um, yeah, it's brilliant conceptually, um, but it uses a it uses a way longer term thinking than I'm used to using as a federal employee. That's for sure. Um, really wanted to thank the Stockbridge Muncie community and the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians because they did a lot of infield demonstrations of understory planting and shared with us the science and the costs associated with the plantings. This allowed us to, like, like, the, like the rice, this allowed us to create a conservation practice standard and a financial incentive to defray the cost of implementing this practice. Um, how are we doing for time, Kier? Oh, we're about there, Chris. <laughs> okay, wonderful. I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation for having a chance to hear Connor's presentation. I'm really interested in following up with them to see how they're, see how they're utilizing the... Um, um, how they're working with the NRCS on it and how we might be able to work a little bit better. Um, and I really wanted to express um, our appreciation for all the patience and goodwill that have been shown to us by the 11 federally recognized tribes. They do have us on a, um, um, they do have us on a better path here in the state of Wisconsin and I know a lot of other states out there. And I know that's a lot of hard work and can't express our appreciation enough. So anyway, if you have any questions on what I talked about today, I'm just chris.borden at usda.gov. Thank you so much, Chris, for your great presentation and an excellent highlight of some of those projects. Uh, I want to open it up briefly for any questions or comments uh, from the attendees of this webinar here. We should have some cricket sound effects. <laughs> All righty, if I don't see any. Um, yeah, again, uh, I do hope that everybody is able to take down Chris's information as well as Connor's information. And, you know, all of our webinars are uh, going to be hosted through uh, YouTube. And then also we're developing a curriculum through the Mighty Networks platform. And so if you go to mightynetworks.com, I believe it is, or you Google Mighty Networks uh, and then tap in Intertribal Agriculture Council, you can sign up there and um, there's a whole lot of information and, you know, various uh, points of curriculum that we're developing. So uh, this portions of this presentation may very well end up there as well. Just one quick note. There's usually some, there's usually a number of people in a state that have, have responsibilities for for us getting better at meeting our tribal trust responsibilities. Um, if you contact, and sometimes that's not immediately uh, evident on our websites. So if you have a question as to who, who logical contacts might be in your state, please drop me an email and I get you contact information. That's great. Alrighty, well, if that's that, then thank you all so much for joining and your engagement. And um, we look forward to continuing our webinar series. <clears throat> Excuse me, this Thursday, we've got a great one coming up on uh, part two on the meat processing facility uh, discussion uh, with indigenous food and agriculture initiatives. So please uh, remain uh, connected in with our, um, let's see, outreach efforts through Facebook, as well as if you're on our email list, uh, that's a way to go. You can go to info at indianag.org uh, to be added to our email list for future uh, webinars as well. And again, thank you so much, Chris and Connor. Uh, your presentations were amazing and I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thanks, appreciate it, Kier. See you later, take care, bye-bye.